In section 5.2, we're going to define the definite integral. A lot of what we're going to do in this section is going to be very similar to section 5.1, except we're going to give a name to those objects that we were dealing with in a more formal setting. So here we're going to interpret the definite integral as an area, define the definite integral as a limit of Riemann sums, and then also compute some definite integrals. So as I said, we're going to do a lot of what we did in section 5.1. We're just going to get rid of the velocity and distance interpretation, just talk about functions in general. So this is very similar to something we saw in 5.1, but we're going to make some changes. Let f be any function, not just representing velocity. And we're not going to find distance traveled, but we're going to find the area under the curve on the interval a to b. That's what we're trying to find here. And we found that that is the same thing as finding distance traveled if f is velocity. So to do that, we're going to find function values at a certain number of points, n number of points, at consistent intervals delta x. And delta x is going to be b minus a over n. That's the same thing as delta t from before. We will use these points to find the area of n rectangles to estimate the area. So looking at this picture, we have n different points that we're looking at. Actually, n plus 1 different points. We have x0 all the way to x sub n minus 1. The first one we're going to call a, the set last one we're going to call b, and we are going to pick one of those points on each interval. So here we have a certain number of intervals. There's one, two, we're skipping a few there. There's a the last one. And the change, the base of each of those intervals, the change in x is going to be delta x in all of those. And what we're going to do is we're going to pick one of them and that's going to, sorry, we're going to pick either the left or the right side of each interval, find the function value at that point, and that's going to give us the height of the rectangle. So if this were some function, f of x, and we were looking at the left Riemann sum, for each interval, I would pick the left endpoint, go up to the function, draw a point, and then draw a rectangle across at that point. And I would do that for every single interval that I have. So the next one I'd have one at x1, go up to the point, draw a rectangle over. Next one at x2, go up to the function, draw and go down. So we're using the height of the function as the function value at the left endpoint. And we're going to add all of those together. So we have the function value f of x naught times the base, that is base times height is the area of a rectangle. So we say this is the height, delta x is the base. So this whole thing is the area of a rectangle. And we're just adding a whole bunch of those together using the left endpoints on each. We can represent this with sigma notation. That's what this letter is, is a capital sigma. And this says that for every i from 0 to n minus 2, we're going to take f of x sub i times delta x. That is, we're going to do x sub 0 plus x sub 1 plus x sub 2 all the way to x sub n minus 2. We could also do the same thing with a right Riemann sum, except we just look at the right endpoints in each case. So the first one, we looked at the right endpoint, f sub x1, that's the height. Delta x is still the same, that's our base. And again, we're finding the area of rectangles and then adding them all together. So here, the only difference between these is what, I should say, the difference between these is where do we start with i? At the left Riemann sum, we start at 0 and go to n minus 2. And the second one, we start at 1 and go to n minus 1. That represents the left and the right endpoints, respectively. So in section 5.1, we did this. We looked at left and right Riemann sums, and we found that the actual value that we're looking for, in this case, area, is going to be bounded between those values. Or at least that's going to be the case if we have an increasing or decreasing function. So this is all pretty much review, but now we're going to go one step further, and we're going to define the integral. And we're going to do that by this idea that if we take more and more rectangles, we get a better estimate of the area. 
So how many rectangles can we possibly have? Well, let's just make it bigger and bigger. In fact, let's let the number of rectangles go to infinity. That is n goes to infinity. So if you have more and more rectangles, the estimation gets better and better. And if it goes to infinity, the power of the limit allows us to say that those are actually equal now. So putting that formally, this definition, if f is a continuous function on a to b, then the limits as n goes to infinity of the left and right Riemann sums are equal. So remember that we have our left Riemann sum here. We have our right Riemann sum here. But we are taking the limit as n goes to infinity. That means we have um, an infinite amount of rectangles. And we're saying that if we do that, then the left and the right are actually the same. And that value is called the definite integral of f from a to b. And we write that as this notation. This weird looking s with an a on the bottom, b on the top, f of x dx. And we'll talk about what everything means there. So we'll look at this on the next page. But let's just think about if we have some function and we look at the left Riemann sum, that means we take the left endpoints each time. I could do a better job of approximating that area if I take more and more rectangles. I'm going to draw a picture where I'm going to draw as many rectangles as I pretty much can, making it clear that I'm actually doing rectangles here. And we can see that the area underneath the curve and the area of the rectangles is pretty much the same based on the width of the pen that I'm using. And that's what, 20 rectangles right there. If instead I had 100 rectangles or a million rectangles or a billion rectangles, there would really be no difference between the actual area and the rectangles, or there'd be such a small difference. And if I let it actually go to infinity, they're equal. And we can also see that in this picture, you'd be pretty hard pressed to determine if I actually did a left or a right Riemann sum. When the rectangles get so small, it doesn't actually matter if we do left or right. That's kind of the idea of this definition. All right, so talking about some of these things in the integral, um, note that we have this limit as n goes to infinity of the sum from i equals 0 to n minus 2, f of x sub i times delta x. And we are saying that is going to be the same thing as the integral from a to b of f of x dx. So let's talk about what all of this is. We said that this delta x here is the base of the rectangles. The f sub x sub i is the height of the rectangles. And when we put those together, we're getting the area of the rectangles. And we're doing the same thing with the integral dx is what we call the base of the rectangle, or we can think about it as the base of a rectangle. f of x is the height of the rectangle. And together we have the area. So dx and delta x are similar, and that's what we kind of say here. dx is called an infinitesimal, and it's an infinitely small change in x. It's really the exact same idea as delta x, except that it's infinitely small, so it has kind of a special property. Then the sum, the sigma, tells us to add the areas together. And that's going to be the same thing with what this notation is telling us. We're going to add the areas together. The only difference is we're adding an infinite amount of things as opposed to a finite or a discrete amount of things. Uh, with the sigma notation. And we can think about this as being kind of similar as 
this is going to be capital sigma. We can think about that as an S for sum. And we have this kind of curvy S shape, right? We have an S shape here as well. And they're very similar in that regard. So these notations are very similar, but one is dealing with a finite number of things or a countable number of things. And one is dealing with an infinite amount of stuff. So now let's explore this idea graphically or geometrically. We have here two um, pictures of an estimation of the area under the curve using left Riemann sums. This is a left Riemann sum with n equal to four, four subdivisions, four rectangles. And here's a left Riemann sum with n equal to eight. And again, what we could do is we could increase the number of rectangles so that it becomes a lot more. And we find that the approximation is better and better and better. And eventually, if we let it get bigger and bigger enough, we can go to this idea that what we're really doing is we're taking infinitely many rectangles for each x value. So it's like I'm drawing a little infinitely small rectangle for each x value. And that's going to take me too long to do, so I can just say dot, dot, dot. And that would give us the actual area under the curve, if I could do that. So when we define the integral, we talked about this in section 5.1. This is going to be the signed area from the function to the x-axis. And we commonly just say this is the area under the curve. We have to be a little bit careful about that because if the function is below the x-axis, we have negative area. Say I have some function like this. This would be positive area. And this would be negative area. But both are looking at the area from the function to the x-axis. So in the next video, we'll do a bunch of practice problems where we look at the area, we look at these, these left and right Riemann sums, and we kind of try to put it all together, finding values of definite integrals. And then looking ahead, we're going to find another way to do definite integrals, that is using the derivative and looking at antiderivatives.